really it's entitled, why would you want to do that? Okay. Just imagine for one moment, not showering for a month, eating dehydrated and canned food, being constantly wet and cold, and living on a 70-foot boat with 16 people you hardly know. Well, that was to be my new world for the next three months. As I wave goodbye to my family in Cape Town, with tears in my eyes, never more appropriate was the, was the question, why would you want to do that? And today, I shall try and answer that question. It all started about a year and a half ago when in the business section of a bookshop here in Mackay, I purchased a book called Team Spirit. It was entitled Life and Leadership on one of the world's toughest yacht races. By the time I got to chapter two, I was already online and I had sent off an app for an application form to join as one of the members of the Clipper Round the World Yacht Race. This was my opportunity to fulfill a dream of circumnavigating the world, a dream that I started when I was sailing with my family as a young girl. The Clipper Round the World Yacht Race is set up and is run by Sir Robin Knox Johnson. And he was the first man to sail single-handed, non-stop, around the world. Now, each boat has a professional skipper and is made up of crew with varying levels of experience, ages, genders, strengths, personalities, and nationalities. Now, once I've been selected, to join as the crew. I then took over a year to prepare for the race. I did three levels of training here in Sydney, and then I flew to the UK where I did level four training with my skipper and my crew on my designated boat. So I participated in legs three and four of the race. And we sailed from Cape Town around, the boat, around to Albany in Western Australia around the bottom of Tasmania to um, Sydney. Then we did the Sydney to Hobart Yacht Race. And from Hobart, we then sailed to Eddie Beach. Now, the race started in London on the 31st of August last year. And today, they are on day 14 of leg seven, on their way to Panama. So as you can see by the route map, it started in London and it's the yellow line going down to Rio de Janeiro. Then leg two was to Cape Town. And in Cape Town, I joined the boat and went up to the end of the pink. For those of you that, so I then joined my boat in Cape Town, um, uh, called Ico Col. And this is where I said goodbye to my family and I set sail across the Southern Ocean. Now, for those of you that don't know about the Southern Ocean, it is one of the most notorious oceans in the world. It has the biggest and largest waves on this planet. And the reason for this is that as a low pressure, or in other words, a storm forms, it has over 3,000 nautical miles of open ocean just to develop and intensify and get stronger. So the waves, there's no land mass in its way to break down or to slow down. The waves just get bigger and bigger and the wind just gets stronger and stronger. So there were challenges that I knew to expect, but there were so many unknowns. I wasn't sure how big the waves really were going to be. You know, how many storms would we have to battle to cross the Southern Ocean? I knew there would be some. Would I be warm enough? Would I freeze out on watch? There wasn't a cat man do I could just run to to buy a new base layer. And would we get along with all these people? Would I get injured or hurt or even fall overboard? And the questions just went on and on and on. But I told myself, this is what I wanted to do. This is how I was going to achieve my goal. Nothing comes easy, so just put your head down and take each day one at a time. So I took each watch one at a time. So when you're racing, you're racing 
At the end of a particular evening, you don't all pack up and go below deck and jump in a cozy bunk and uh, that's it and we'll wake up in the morning. We were 16 crew on the first race. And that was divided into two watches of eight and we did six hours on and six hours off in the daytime and four hours on and four hours off at night. So that meant you never got more than three hours sleep at any one time in an evening. So we were then woken up 30 to 40 minutes before our watch was due to begin. And this was to ensure that you were up on deck on time and you were only allowed to go below deck once your bunk buddy came up on deck. So yes, you do share a bunk with somebody. So when you get out of your bunk, you wrap everything up, you put it all away, and your bunk buddy then comes back into your, into your bunk. Now to call it a bunk is a little bit of an exaggeration. It's like a stretcher that the paramedics use, and it operates on a pulley system. So that's the angle it would be kept at. So we lower it down, you climb into the bunk, but bear in mind that the boat lives at about 45 degrees. If you're sailing with the wind forward, it's at 45 degrees. And it then pounds about. So you pull yourself up you, until you wedged into that bunk. And that is where most of the accidents happen at sea, where people fall out of their bunks while they're at sea. And you also only ever fall asleep out of pure exhaustion on about day three. And then when you do actually fall asleep, it is broken sleep. You've got winches grinding above you the whole time. The waves are crashing against the side of the boat and the wind is howling and the off watch are also living their life and they're making sail changes and carrying on with their things. So another reason we were woken up that 30 to 40 minutes before we were on watch is that it took so long to actually get dressed. Now I would sleep in a base layer to my base layer, I would add a mid layer, then I would add a Gore-Tex outer layer. And on top of that then, you would put on a dry suit or your heavy weather gear, depending on how rough it was outside. Now, a dry suit is one of the most amazing inventions ever, but it is a nightmare to climb into. It has these tight rubber seals around your wrists and around your neck, and it's a sealed unit. Now, you've got to remember, we're doing this five times in a 24-hour period. And you are getting dressed in a confined space with seven other people, all struggling, leaning against some stable service to try and get all your kit on. The other thing that you do is that the clothes that you're putting on are still wet. They're still wet from your previous watch. We can't put it in the dryer for three hours while we sleep. So you're now putting on wet clothes, but you hope that at least your base layer has dried. That's why you sleep in your base layer, so that your body heat dries out your base layer, so at least you could have one dry layer against you. Now the last essential piece of a kit that we put on is a life jacket. All our life jackets were fitted with an AIS. That's a device that if we were to fall in the water, we would activate it, and our boat could then find us. Now, it is only your boat that is going to save you out in the Southern Ocean. You can't get air sea rescue out there. It's your boat that's going to save you. Um, now, I've often been asked what was the scariest part of my trip. And it wasn't the huge waves or the 80 knot winds we, discussed, we, we um, encountered, or nearly being washed overboard at night while doing a head sail change only to be saved by my lifeline that kept me on board was actually helming or steering the boat. So when you take over the helm, you are now responsible for your crew and your boat. So you're, you're sailing down, you're doing 25 knots, sailing downwind, you've got 40 knots of wind with a spinnaker flying and it's pitch dark outside and all you can feel is the waves picking up the back of the boat and surging her forward. And you've got seawater spraying in your eyes and your eyes are stinging and your hands are now, you've lost the feelings in the end of your fingertips because it's so cold and you're from your wet gloves. And you're exhausted, but you have to keep concentrating every second that you are out there. 
Now that was the scariest time, but it also was the most exciting and the most exhilarating. And you feel alive and it's just amazing feeling. You just cannot explain it. Now the reality of it is that no helicopter can land in the Southern Ocean. And no aircraft can get out to you. So you rely on your team. You are out there as a team. So sometimes at night, when I was sitting there out on watch, it was cold and dark, and I only had, still had three hours left to go of my watch, I would ask myself the question, what are you doing? And I think, was I just dissatisfied with my life? Was I bored? Maybe I'm just a bit crazy. Um, but if I had to answer that in two words, I would say it was self-fulfillment. And maybe using three words, I'd say fulfilling a dream. But this still doesn't really answer why I want to leave my family and two small boys for three months, risk serious injury. There were crew members hurting themselves all the time. And also risk not returning. We had a death on board our boat just before I was due to join the boat, which made many people question what I was doing. I was scared and I was nervous before I left. And there were many people that said to me, it's not too late to pull out. But I wanted to do it. I needed to do it. I was committed to it, to do it. I needed to do it for me, for my self-fulfillment. This all led me to question exactly what is self-fulfillment? What does it actually mean? It, one definition is it's the unfolding of what is best and strongest in yourself. Self-fulfillment is not a goal. It's an accumulation of experiences. It's a process of development that is attained by the achievement or the fulfillment of your goals, your aspirations, whatever that may be. You will all have different goals and aspirations. That's what makes us unique. You may not all like sailing. I have no idea why you wouldn't, but um, you, I assume some of you don't like it. For some of you, it may be achieved by climbing a mountain, or passing your driver's license, or making cap, cap team. You know, or even getting an OP1 or 2 or running a marathon. The road to your goal is difficult to define, to plan, and to achieve, but it's worth it. The key is to challenge yourself, to step out of your comfort zone, and take charge, create your own future. The bigger the challenge, the bigger the sense of achievement. We all need to know what our dreams are, identify our full potential. And then you need to discuss, ideally discuss it with your family or write it down. You know, rather than watching TV one night, discuss it as a family. What are your, your family's goals and achievements? What are your plans? And then you need to attack it with the positive view that it will come true. You need to believe in yourself. And if there's there's a true saying, there's a very good saying I really honestly believe in. Where there's a will, there's a way. When I first started researching about the race and I realized I'd be away from my family for three months, my initial thought was, there's no way. There's no way I can do that. Who would pick up the boys from school each day? My husband cannot cook. Who would, how would they eat each night? And they can't even get ready for school in the morning when I'm there. How are they going to do it if I'm not there? And I was a family accountant who would pay all the bills. And the list of questions just went on and on and on. But I tackled each question and each challenge one at a time until I slowly overcame the mountain that was ahead of me. There will always be obstacles and forces against you. That's just part of life. You need to just overcome each one, one at a time, and stay focused on your goal. And by doing this, I made one of my goals a reality. And you can too. I challenge you all to start dreaming today.